OK. Let's, uh, let's talk to the Lord first before we go back to this time Romans chapter 7. Father, once again, we thank you that we trust your word, not because primarily of its content, but because of its origin, that this comes to us from the mind and more importantly, from the heart of God. And we pray that you'll encourage us in it, teach us, uh, give us a sense of encouragement that we have the resources available to us to live as you want us to live. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, this morning we're going to Romans chapter 7. And uh, I'm going to read you a section of this chapter. I'm going to put it on the screen. We can read it. I'll read it, but you can follow it carefully, which is the heart of what I'm going to uh, talk about. It's Romans 7, verse 15. I'm going to read from. Uh, he says, uh, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do, I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good as it is. It is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do, no, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do, I do not want to do. It's no longer I who do it, but sin living in me that does it. Does that make sense? <laughs> I mean, basically, what he's saying is this. There are certain things that are good, and I agree with them, and I want to do them, but I don't. And there are certain things in life that are bad, I know they're bad, I agree they're bad, I say I'm never going to do those things again. Anybody here recognize that? <laughs> of course you do. This chapter has provoked a lot of discussion and controversy, um, not least in the question, who is Paul talking about in that section? Is it a non-Christian he's talking about? You're right, he says I. But is it a non-Christian he's talking about? Some have said he's talking about uh, a time before he was a Christian. Is, is, is he referring to when he says in verse 14, I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. It sounds like it. If you met somebody, went down to the beach somewhere and you got in conversation and uh, you started to talk about uh, uh, Christian things and the person said, well, you know, I'm unspiritual. Personally, I'm sold as a slave to sin. You probably say to yourself, I don't think this person is a Christian. So is that who Paul is talking about? Or is he talking about, or we might call a defeated Christian. It might seem so in verse 22 and 23, where he says, in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin, work within my members. So if you met somebody who said, oh yes, I, I delight in the law of God, but goodness me, I find myself all the time uh, doing those things that are in conflict with it. You'd say, well, you may be a Christian, but you know, it sounds like you're struggling, really struggling. Or is this a description of a normal Christian? Because in verse 18 he says, I desire to do what is good. That sounds like a Christian. I delight in God's law. That sounds like a Christian. In my mind, I'm a slave to God's law. That sounds like a Christian. So we have a problem here. And uh, in verse uh, 15, sorry, verse, well, verse 15, I'll read verse 15. He says, uh, I don't understand what I do. I want to do right, 
what I want to do, I don't do. What I hate, I do. But here's an interesting dilemma. He says in verse 17, it is no longer I myself who do it, but sin living in me. And in verse 20, he says, if I do what I don't want to do, it's no longer I who do it, but sin living in me that does it. That sounds like a bit of a cop out, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It's no longer I who do it. If uh, at the end of this session, we got into a discussion, I suddenly you know, pull back my arm, clench my fist, and thumped you in the nose, and say, oh, that wasn't me who did that. No, no, I didn't do that. That was sin living in me that did that. Would you accept that as an explanation? <laughs> no. No. And uh, if I did it again, oh, sorry, that was sin in me, is where you say, listen, there's some sin in me too. You probably hit me back. So what does Paul mean? It's no longer I myself who do it, but sin living in me. Well, he's talking there about sin, not as actions, but as a principle. A principle he calls in verse 23, the law of sin at work within my members. A bit like the law of gravity. If I hold this pen in the air, let it go, it's going to fall. Not because I give it a push, but because there's a law that says what goes up must come down. And it pulls its ground. Now, says Paul, there's a law in me called the law of sin which is creating and setting up this dilemma where I know what is right and what is good, and I want what is right and I want what is good. Sin operating within me. And this introduces us to three spiritual laws in this chapter, which is what I want to talk to you about. There's, first of all, the law of God in verse 7. I would not have known what sin was except through the law. I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. So here, he's clearly talking about the law that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. And uh, the law that he says uh, is uh, holy. In verse 12, the law is holy. The commandment is holy, righteous, and good. So there's a law that God has revealed to us, which I recognize that is good, that is holy, that is right. But there's a second law, which is what he calls the law of sin. In my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. So that's the second law. This law, which reveals God's character, and this second law, the law of sin, which, uh, which is resisting his character. And then we'll come to this Look at later. There's the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, he talks about in verse chapter 8 and verse 2. Through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. So there's these three laws in this chapter. The law of God, which reveals the character of God. The law of sin, which resists the character of God. I'll explain why the law reveals the character of God in a few minutes. And thirdly, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which restores the character of God. That then is the outline of uh, what Paul talks about in chapter 7, going into the early part of chapter 8. First of all then, the law of God, which reveals the character of God. This is uh, what we call the, uh, the, the moral law. Uh, verse 14, he says, we know the law is spiritual. In verse 12, he says, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. And this is what is embodied in the Ten Commandments that God gave to Moses. And when God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses, they're basically an autobiographical statement God made about himself. They're not an arbitrary set of rules to keep people out of mischief. But the law reveals the character of God. Now, I haven't got time to, to show you why that is so in detail this, this morning because we won't have time to, to cover the other things I, I need to talk about. But when God said, you shall not steal, it's not because stealing isn't nice, but because God is not a thief and human beings were made to be in his image. And so the law reveals what God's image is like. 
And because God is not a thief, you shall not steal. That's one of the commandments. When he says you shall not bear false witness, it's because, it's because God never tells lies and you may be in his image. So do not bear false witness. You shall not commit adultery. Why not? Because God is totally faithful. You are made to be in his image. So don't ever commit adultery. When he said you shall not murder, that is arbitrarily take life. God has, is the author of life and death. But you are made in his image. So do not kill. Do not murder. Uh, even when he says things like six days shall you labor on the seventh day do no work, it's because it says in that law, because God rests on the seventh day. Not because he was tired after six days of hard creating, but because he was finished. And so we rest in the finished sufficiency of God. Even when it says, uh, children, honor your father and mother. Or not just children, but just honor your father and mother. It's because in the Trinity, the Son says, I do those things to please the Father. And we're made to be in God's image. So children, honor your parents and so on. So this law is given to reveal the character of God. That's why God gave it to Moses on Mount Sinai, in the book of Exodus. And that's why it is the plumb line by which the people are measured because we were created to be a physical expression of God's moral character. And this explains in some practical terms what that expression looks like. So Paul says, this law is good. This law is holy. This law is uh, righteous. Uh, and this law is spiritual. Those are the words he uses in those couple of verses I've put up there. But although I recognize that and I delight in that, and he says he delights in the law of God, in my mind in verse 25, in fact, I put that on here, I think, yes. Um, in verse 22, in my mind, in my inner being, I delight in God's law because I know it's good, it's holy, it's righteous, as he says. I delight in it. In my mind, I'm a slave to God's law. But here's the problem. I'm subject to this law of sin which resists the character of God within me because verse 22 and 23 says, for in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. So although I delight in God's law, I find I'm subject to this other pull, this law which resists what is right that makes me a prisoner of the law of sin. Now, if we don't understand this about ourselves in our natural state, then we will try to refine ourselves and we'll hope that we can muster the self-discipline itself to change and live differently and we will become disappointed. We can make promises to God about how good we're going to be and despite the greatest intentions, we will fail. We may become disillusioned with ourselves, but God never is for the simple reason he doesn't suffer many illusions about this place. He knows the corruption of the human heart. And that is what Paul is talking about here. That I have inherited a corrupt nature, a fallen nature, that recognizes the law of God, but resists it and fights it and this is going on within ourselves. That's why we have to be careful of blaming the devil for our sin. If the devil died tonight, we would be tempted tomorrow because that verse I gave you in the last session, James 1.14, says each one is tempted when by his own desire he is dragged away and enticed. By our own desire. You know, it's interesting that when you look at the demonic activity in the Gospels and in the book of Acts and there are 32 references there to demons and evil spirits uh, working in people's lives they have all kinds of physical powers but they're never credited with moral powers so for instance there are people who are blind because of a demon uh, dumbness was a result of a 
a demon. Uh, they could give severe pain to somebody. They can give physical suffering. They can give unusual strength. A man can break chains because he is possessed by evil spirits. They can give a man convulsions. They can throw a man onto the ground. They can cause a man to act as though he's insane. They can drive pigs into the sea. They can predict the future. But demons are never credited with moral power in the New Testament. That comes from within us. I had a friend who was speaking at a church in the south of England, and uh, a lady came to talk to him at the end of a meeting he was speaking at. He was doing several days there. And a lady came one night and said to him, would you pray for me? He said, uh, sure, what's the, what's the issue? She said, I'm struggling with demons. He said, uh, okay, tell me more. She said, I have a demon of greed, and I have a demon of pride, I have a demon of lies, I have a demon of envy, a demon of lust, a demon of this, a demon of that. She gave him a whole list of things that she was struggling with. And she said, I have, a, I have these demons in me. He said, uh, you mean to say you have a demon of greed? She said, yes, and a demon of pride, and a demon of lies, and a demon of lust, and a demon of envy, and a demon of this, demon of that. She said, yes. He said, that's remarkable. She said, why? He said, I can do all those things all by myself. <laughs> he said, I don't have a single demon. I struggle with every one of those things. He said, madam, your need is not exorcism. Your need is repentance. Because these things come from within. As, uh, uh, as uh, Scripture tells us, that these these things initially come from within us because we are subject to this law of sin that is pulling us down and despite the greatest intention left to our own resources, for our own devices, we're going to fail. Now, this is encouraging stuff, isn't it? <laughs> it it's not uh, what we like to hear, but something else is equally true. And it is this. So when a person becomes a Christian, the Holy Spirit comes to live within their life. That's what makes a person a Christian. As Romans 8 verse 9 says, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. And he, becomes to, he comes to live a new life in us, and it's this life as we're going to see in just a moment, that is the law of, spirit, of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that alone can set us free. But let me just take you back to the verses I read earlier. I'm going to read them again, and I want you to just listen this time and see if you can pick out a recurring word uh, in, in these verses. Listen carefully. I'll read from verse 15 to 24. I'll read it quickly. See if you can pick out the recurring word. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. What I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree the law is good. As it is, it's no longer I myself who do it, but sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me. That is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. What I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it's no longer I who do it, but sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil's right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am. Anybody get the word? <laughs> 38 times in those few verses, I, me, my, in 10 verses, and this is somebody saying, I want to live according to the law of God. I delight in the law of God. I want to live according to it. But when I try I agree, all these things he says here. I want to do what is good. I find left my own resources. I can't do it. So he says in verse 24, what a wretched man 
I am who will rescue me from this body of death. Not what will rescue me, like is there a technique that will rescue me? Is there a method that will rescue me? Is there a program? Is there an experience? All these things come along in the evangelical marketplace and they change every few years because they don't last and they don't work. But that's not his question. Not what, but who. And he answers his own question. Thanks be to God, it's through Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's not a what, it's a who. Somebody else has got to do it. And then two verses later, he says, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets me free. Or well, the Lord, the, through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life sets me free from the law of sin and death. He says, this is not disciplining myself and determining alone. It is realizing I cannot live this life by myself. When I first became a Christian, I was 12 years of age. And um, I knew something had happened because I had an appetite I didn't have before to do what was right and what was good. And I tried and I failed. And uh, I used to go to youth meetings we used to have in those days when people came together from different churches, they had them every month, and the preacher used to preach the same kind of message. And the message goes something like this. There's some of you here tonight, although you've been a Christian for a while, I think I said this on Sunday morning, didn't I? I talked talk somewhere along this line. Uh, although you've been a Christian for a while, there's not much to show for it. And he would challenge us to dedicate ourselves, which I did, and then rededicate next time, and rededicate. And I went through a process over several years of promising God, sometimes through my tears, God, I promise you I'm going to live for you. And it never worked until I came to understand that he doesn't ask my dedication, but my dying to myself, that his life might instead be the one that sets us free through Christ Jesus, the Lord, the Spirit of life, sets us free from sin and death. And let me illustrate this. I was leading a week of meetings in a church in the city of Cape Town in South Africa some years ago. And I was working through, uh, speaking through John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, which as you know, are chapters about Jesus in the upper room with his disciples. And in those chapters, he says about himself, the words I speak to you, the works I do are not mine, it's my Father living in me, doing his work. He says, because three times Jesus said in John's Gospel, I myself can do nothing. Don't congratulate me for raising Lazarus from the dead. I didn't do that. Don't congratulate me for preaching the Son of Man. I didn't do that or feeding 5,000 people. No, he says, I myself can do nothing. It's the Father living in me who is doing his work. That's what Jesus said about himself. In John 14, he says that, the Father living in me. Then in John 15, he says to the disciples, and without me, you can do nothing because I'm the vine, you're the branches, you abide in me, I abide in you, and my life in you will express itself through you in fruit, and you'll bear fruit. But without me, you can do nothing. I was explaining this. And uh, on about Wednesday night, I think it was, a guy came to me, he was going down to Friday night, this series of meetings, and he said, you know, I've been a Christian for several years. I've never understood this before. I've been trying hard to live for Christ, and it, it hasn't been working. And uh, I've never heard this idea that it's Christ living in me that is going to be my strength and the source of it. He said, but what do I have to do to make this work? Because I'm not some kind of zombie, just sit back and say, well, I can't, and it's going to be Christ that does it. I said, no, you're absolutely right. You're not going to be a zombie. There are things to do. But I said, come back tomorrow night, and, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll be talking about this in the next couple of nights. The next night, he came to me and said, look, I'm really excited by this, but I still don't understand what I have to do to make it work. I said, well, come back tomorrow night. He said, I can't. 
Tomorrow night was the last night. He said, uh, I'm working from 4 o'clock tomorrow. Uh, I, uh, c can I uh, see you for breakfast? And I said, well, I'm speaking at a businessman's breakfast tomorrow morning. And so I'm afraid I can't talk to you then, but you can come if you like. Maybe we get a chance to chat a bit. He said, well, but after breakfast, I said, well, I'm going to speak at a, there's a Bible college, Bible training institute in South Africa. I'm going to speak at that, their morning chapel. He said, well, can we meet after that for lunch? I said, well, then I'm going to the YWAM training school and I'm having lunch with them and then talking to them after lunch. I'm not going to be free until about mid-afternoon. He said, well, I start working at four. Uh, I said, well, I'm free then, but I'm sorry, that's, I'm not free until then. And the next morning, I was leaving to go back home. And uh, he was about to turn away. And he said, um, uh, are you free at four? And I said, yes. He said, well, I'll tell you what I do. He said, I'm a helicopter pilot. And every Friday night, I have the same job, which is at about 5 o'clock. I take up a cop and a radio announcer, and we fly on Cape Town for about an hour and a half. It's rush hour. Everybody's leaving Cape Town on a Friday night. And we report back the flow of traffic. Every 50 minutes, there's a live traffic report on the radio given by the guy who's sitting in the helicopter who can see it all from the air. And uh, he said, uh, it's the most boring thing I do because we just go around in circles for, for an hour and a half and it takes two minutes to go around Cape Town. So he said, uh, but there's a spare seat in the helicopter. Would you be willing to come and we could chat? So I said, I'd love to come. I'd love to fly around Cape Town in a helicopter. Really <laughs> well, that's right. We did have headphones. And um, so he said, if you come at four, uh, we, You've got to sign a document and say, I'm not responsible for you. And uh, he said, uh, we'll have a cup of tea. And then we go up about 4.30. So I turned up at 4. And when I turned up at the helipad, there's this big sturdy looking helicopter in the foreground. Four wheels, long tail, big propeller on top. So it looked as though I seated about 12 people. And uh, so that's a sturdy looking helicopter. We walked around it. And the other side was this flimsy little glass bubble on skis you know, with a kind of mesh tail, with, with, with a, uh, a helicopter, uh, with a propeller shaft that, you know, was about as thick as a microphone stand. Uh, man, that thing looks very flimsy. It was chained to the ground. And I said to this guy, w w which is a helicopter, he said, it's a little one. I said, the little one? You uh, look as though you don't get in. You look as though you put that one on. It looks so small. He said, no, it's perfectly safe. I, I, I fly it most days. So we went in, and I said, look, I'm a bit nervous. This thing looks so flimsy. Can you tell me how it works? He said, well, how much do you want to know? I said, well, just explain the basics of it. He said, well, you know, uh, the principles of aerodynamics are that if uh, you can create lift that exceeds the weight, and you create thrust that exceeds drag, you can lift the machine off the ground and fly it forward. And he explained this to me. And uh, I tried to look intelligent, say things like, yes, uh-huh, OK. <laughs> and uh, I said, so what would you call this? Well, that's the law of aerodynamics. So I said, OK, what do I have to do to make sure that I'm safe with you? Do I have to flap anything? He said, flap anything? I said, well, you know, I noticed the birds flap. He said, are you kidding me? And I said, yes, I am. I said, I've been explaining this week that you yourself, I myself, are subject, I hadn't talked from Romans 7, but this was the principle, to a natural law of sin that is all the time pulling us down, but there's a new law, which is the life of Jesus Christ in us that sets us free, and you abide in me, I in you, and you will bear fruit. It'll be my life in you. It's not you doing things for me. It'll be me doing things in and through you, his life in you. And I said... And you've been explaining the same principle to me, that the law of aerodynamics sets me free from the law of gravity. I said, there's a verse out of pocket New Testament, Romans 8 verse 2, where Paul says, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets me free from the law of sin and death. I said, Paul might have been sitting in a helicopter when he wrote that, because he's telling, me, he's telling us there the same principle you just explained to me, that I subject myself to a new law, a new power, that will set me free. Now, of course, the illustration is poor because we don't just sit back as zombies. 
But we took off, we flew around. He said to me, oh, I can't be as simple as that. We flew around Cape Dam for the hour and a half and so on, then we landed. And I said, you've been demonstrating the Christian life to me for the last 90 minutes. I said, the law of gravity, enough one moment gave up during the time we were flying. The law of gravity is totally committed to smashing us to the ground any moment that the law of aerodynamics ceases to function. We're going to be a lump of strawberry jam on the ground. And in the same way, the law of, the spirit of, uh, the, the law of sin at work in us is totally committed to smashing us to the ground, totally committed to destroying us. But as long as we're living in dependence on that new life, and along with that, as we'll see later, disciplines that go with that that we've talked about, that he works in us both to will and to act according to his good pleasure. He puts the right desires, he puts the right enabling, he sets us free. And of course, not for one moment am I able to fly. I am being flown. Not for one moment can I live the Christian life by human ability. We live it in the power of that new life that he puts within us. The helicopter didn't give me the ability to fly. It flew me. And that's a big difference. That's why I never ask God to give you strength, by the way. In fact, I jotted some verses down here that, uh, that uh, scriptures that say, the Lord is my strength. Not give me strength. He is my strength. That's in Exodus 15, verse 2. Psalm 28, 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. Psalm 118, 14. The Lord is my strength and my song. Isaiah 12, 2. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Isaiah 33, 2. O Lord, be our strength every morning. Habakkuk 3.19, the sovereign Lord is my strength, and so on. These verses, it's not that he gives us strength. Will you please help me? He is our strength. Uh, as we live in union with him, which is what chapter 15 was talking about, that we live in union with him, he in us creates within us that new appetite, new resources, new strength, new power to live the life that he's called us to live. And it's not that we become passive, because chapter 8 and verse 3 uh, goes on to say, I mean, how do we live this way? I'll read verse 3 and 4 as well as verse 5, which I put on the screen there. But verse 3 and 4 say, what the law was powerless to do, and it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son, the likeness of sinful man, to be a sin offering, and so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us. We do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And then the next verse explains this. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what they desire. Those who live according to the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires, which is what we talked about a little bit in the last session as well that as I explained then, the word repent, the Greek word is metanoia, means to change the mind. The act of repentance by which a person becomes a Christian becomes an attitude of repentance by which we be the Christian we have become. Uh, a mind that turns from ourselves, uh, from the things that that old nature, that law of sin desires, uh, to that which the spirit desires. And um, as I said a bit before, the role of the mind here is crucial. Uh, Romans 12, verse 2, later on, uh, says, oh, sorry, this is what I've just said here. Here's the verse, Romans 12, verse 2. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Not that it's a psychological process. It's just addressing your mind. But your mind takes you to that dependence and obedience. Those two things go together. Obedience and dependence. As I said before, it's like two wings on an airplane. And obedience without dependence is just doing our best, trying our hardest. It leads to legalism and uh, uh, frustration. And uh, just dependence without obedience 
is unhealthy mysticism. It's obedience coupled with dependence, and we fly. We obey what he says. That's my part, obeying what he does, and then depending on him to be at work in us and to us to accomplish what he's about. And, and let me say, too, at this point, that you will be the last person, we are the last people to see Christ working in ourselves. You know, if you look into a spiritual mirror in the hope you'll look back and say, oh yes, I'm really being spiritual today, you'll be disappointed and discouraged. Because when you look inside, when I look inside, we see this old nature pulling us down all the time, that we're battling with it and we're struggling with it. There's a man that uh, my wife and I knew well, a godly man who was in the hospital, he had a stroke, a couple of strokes, not the guy I referred to yesterday, another one. And we'd gone to visit him. And um, he was sitting in a wheelchair next to his bed. He was weak and frail. He used to be a strong, he used to play rugby, which is like American football without the, without the armor. <laughs> It's a good, rough game. In his younger days, he was a great rugby player. And uh, he'd been a big, strong man. But now he was weak and thin. And uh, he was sitting in a wheelchair next to his bed. And he said to us, I've never known spiritual warfare like I'm experiencing sitting in this wheelchair. He said there are temptations that I thought I dealt with years ago and they were gone but they're back he said the things I thought I'd never struggle with I'm struggling with them again he said I didn't know that my mind was so dirty and I felt a bit embarrassed he was a man we respected a godly man I wasn't sure what to say to him so I said something silly like well you've given the devil a hard time for many years and maybe now that you're weak, he's putting the boot in. And, but that didn't help him at all. And then before we left, we prayed. And when he prayed, his voice became strong. And he prayed to God as a man who knew God. And we left. That was the last time we saw him. He died shortly afterwards. When I entered the corridor, I met a nurse coming to his room. And as we passed, I said something like, uh, you look after him, won't you? I said, oh, yes, we look after everybody here. He said, well, you know, he's a special man. And uh, she stopped. We were passing each other. She stopped. She said, he is a special man, isn't he? I said, well, we think so. She said, well, actually, we do as well. She said, uh, we talk about him sometimes in the staff room because everybody loves working with him. And she said, what's special about him? I said, well, you know he's a Christian. She said, oh, well, yes, we have lots of Christians here. I said, well, what do you think is special? She said, when we were talking the other day, one of the nurses said, whenever I spend time, his name was Alan Redpath, whenever I spend time with Alan Redpath, I always come away feeling clean. There's something about him that is clean. And this nurse said, when she said that, we said, that's exactly it. There's something about him that's beautifully clean. And as we left the hospital, we thought, isn't that interesting? Alan said to us, I've never known such warfare as I've seen be having in this wheelchair. Temptations I thought I'd conquered years ago are back. I didn't know my mind was so dirty. But the nurse said, why is he so clean? You won't see Christ in yourself. You'll see the struggle, the battle. It's other people who see Christ in us. That's why don't try to be spiritual. Don't, don't try to be godly. Uh, as it says in Hebrews 12, uh, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 12, 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfect of faith. Keep your sights on him. He look after what he's doing in your life. Another verse, 2 Corinthians 18, 3, verse 18. I didn't put these down, but 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. 
It says, we who with unveiled faces or reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Now he says, with nothing between us and the Lord, we reflect his glory and we are being transformed, but we don't see that. You're looking to him. Keep your eyes on him. Keep your trust on him. Keep your dependence on him. Keep your love for him. Enjoy his love for you. And he will do things in you that you will never see or recognize. And so what Paul is saying in this chapter, I think, 7 and 8, is here's a dilemma that every Christian is living with. We know the law is good. We know the law is righteous. We know the law is holy. He uses those words. We know it comes from God. We know it reveals the character of God. We rejoice in it. We, we meditate on it. All of that. But although I do that, I find there's another law, the law of sin, a work within my members that is resisting that law, resisting the character of God, seeking to pull me down like gravity, and when I try to do my best, 38 times, I, I, me, my, I, I, not a mention of the Holy Spirit, not a mention of Christ, me trying to live for him, I find I end up saying, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me? There's a new life. It's the life of the Spirit of Jesus Christ in me that sets me free. Sometimes, you know, when you see an aircraft going across the sky, you look up there and you see the vapor trail it leaves behind. You think, what a beautiful uh, line that f plane is flying in. But if you were on board that plane, you might be going through all kinds of turbulence. And uh, other people see the plane. You see the turbulence. We experience that turbulence that goes on within us all the time, that struggle, that battle, which is why we never become complacent uh, we never arrive because if ever you started to think, if we started to think I'm arriving, bang, we hit the turbulence and that law of sin is at work, pulling, struggling. We say, Lord Jesus, I trust you. I set my mind on the things of God and I, as we were talking before, exercise that discipline that we talked about, make my body my slave that I might... Uh, live in the fullness of his life um, indwelling us. So that's the message there, of Romans 7 into that early part of Romans 8. And the rest of Romans 8 then talks about the Holy Spirit's work within the life of a Christian. And uh, we'll talk about that uh, in the session this afternoon. Okay? Thank you, Lord, that your word is true, but your word is never detached from yourself. And the truth it teaches us is, is made experiential by the indwelling of your spirit within us. And we thank you for that and pray we will know that increasingly and that other people in us will know something of the Lord Jesus because of it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.